For those of you that are joining us for the first time, Stars in the Salon is typically, it's sort of an artist round table, artist interview that we do with the cast. And it's usually in the Beverly Sills Salon, which is the name of our lobby of the theater, but it is not uh, today, it is virtual. So I'm gonna call it Stars Not in the Salon, uh, Stars in Your Home. Um, so we're gonna jump right in because we have everybody here in our cast and our artistic team. I'm gonna start off with our conductor who is Bruce Stasna because Bruce only has 30 minutes. So we're gonna jump in with him first. So Bruce, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good afternoon, ciao. Depending on your time Astro. zone, ciao. So um, you all know Bruce, uh, many of you, most of you that are on this call know Bruce in his various roles with San Diego Opera as course master. He's also our music administrator, but he's we're getting to know him better and better as a conductor. He's conducted now several times for us, starting the Detour series, but last year conducting on the main stage, if we call it that, in our drive through of Barriere Sevilla. So you got to see Bruce conducting a big opera in that regard. And now he's conducting on the main stage, which we're very excited about. So welcome, Maestro Bruce. Um, let's start off with you. Is uh, Have you conducted a cozy before? I have. And can, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, OK. Um, it's brilliant. Um, it's going to be like incrementally less brilliant than this one by the smallest hair of a chinny chin chin now. Um, but the, the beauty in conducting Cozy is, uh, um, yeah, I, I mentioned this at the very beginning of our, our musical sessions with the cast. If you think about the great uh, Lorenzo da Ponte, Mozart collaborations, the three of them, starting off with Nozze di Figaro, we have a cast of 11. Then Don Giovanni is the second opera um, in the collaboration with a cast of uh, nine. And then we come down to, as you said, uh, uh, an, uh, truly an ensemble cast, a cast of six, and so the, the, the writing is so much more integrated between the two sisters and the two, um, the two friends, uh, Fernando Guglielmo, and then Don Alfonso and Don uh, Despina, that you have these very, very tight knit types of organisms that in your particular casting of this, David, I have to compliment you because what's gonna make this great is the beauty and the how these voices really, really fit together. And that's super exciting because when we're singing duets, they're stunning. When we're singing quartets, just those voices on stage are perfectly balanced. We get into these great sextets which permeate the opera. It's nothing short of glorious. Yeah, great, I agree. Um, I mean, I, I, was in, I wasn't in rehearsal last night, but I was in rehearsal uh, the night before in the theater. So we're now, you know, in the theater, which I got to say to everybody, it was just such a nice uh, feeling to step foot back at the Civic Theater and remember what it feels like to sit at my little desk in there with, uh, you know, in, in the seats and walking around. Because one of the first things I always do is just check all the sidelines. And so going up and down to all the different levels and, and but hearing these voices in our theater, it's a just a really amazing cast. And we did really well on this one. And because it's ensemble, we have to be really mindful of the balance of everybody together. And uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled with that. Bruce, just talk a little bit about some, some of the wonderful moments that you love about Cozy. Oh gosh, they're all wonderful moments for me, but yeah. to be specific, you know, we, we start off and you think about the, the opening series of trios with the, with the, with the boys. And, and there are three separate numbers that are really beautifully integrated into one larger entity. And so there's this sense of incredible flow and pace that's established with the piece. And then we meet the sisters in their beautiful duet. And he starts to add and add character by character. So then when we get to the final uh, sextet in act uh, one, we, we've experienced uh, uh, several sets of trios, the great uh, duet with, with, the, with the girls that started off and then into a, this incredibly um, sophisticated and sensitive and tender quintet um, that they sing as the, the boys are going off to their mission. Um, of course, one of the most sublime moments for me, and I'm sure many, many other people are, is the, the famous Suave uh, Si El Vento trio of Act One. And because, um, you know, I'm a new father, I can't help but brag about that, but also it's Archer, my baby, my 11-week-year-old baby boy's favorite part of Così Fan Tutte. The trio. The trio. Well, he has very good taste. So he does. Um, <laughs> I have to say uh, for everyone, you know, we do a lot of Zoom calls with staff, as you can imagine. 
Uh, and so there's oftentimes that Bruce will be sitting in a Zoom call and suddenly this like this little baby head will come up as he's sitting in his lap. And he does seem to be like really enamored of music. So, you know, you yeah. pass that yeah. along, which is great. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to Timothy Nelson, which we're going to refer to him. We're going to call him Tim because I know him. So I'm going to call him Tim. So Tim, welcome. This is your first time in San Diego. And uh, I just want to say, how are you enjoying your experience so far? Yeah, I love the city. I'm, I'm from, I live in Washington, D.C., where, where it's very cold at the moment. There's lots of snow on the ground. So I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, this is one of the best times of year to be as just, and uh, you know, one of the secrets, singers, make sure you share this with your friends. Like, yeah, San Diego's not such a bad place to work during the, um, you know, February time period as you start to watch everything happen on the East Coast. So yeah, it's a good time to be here. Um, your first time directing for us, uh, I just want to tell everybody, we had planned production with Tim, actually, not during this slot, I think it was last year during the during the COVID period, uh, but of uh, Magic Flute. And that's sort of where we started. And that got put on hold, let's say, uh, for the time being. And we decided to change it to Cozy. Uh, but you really love this opera, right, Tim? I, I, it's my favorite Mozart without question. It's also the one I'm most terrified of. <laughs> so tell us, tell us why it's your favorite and why are you the most terrified of it? Sure. sure. I mean, Mo, as Bruce was saying, at the, Cozy is the last of the De Ponte operas, so it's really Mozart at the pinnacle of his powers as a dramatic composer. And, and for me, I, I think that he had sort of figured out musical storytelling. He mastered that in Figaro and Giovanni. And by the time he gets to Cozy Pantute, he's doing something that no other composer did before or after, which was not so much be interested in telling a story with music, but in capturing an essential human experience in the music and in the the, to, to experience the music is to feel that emotion. And um, for that, he chose, you know, the story of, of, of what it is to learn that, that, that hearts can be broken. Um, mm. And that's something that everyone that will ever have seen this opera or ever, or, or ever has seen the opera can relate to. Um, and, but it makes it a challenge for a stage director because how do you put something on the stage that doesn't in some way diminish the perfectness of this score. I mean, the score mm. is ab absolutely perfect. So, so it's a lot scarier than Figaro or Giovanni where you just have to tell the story well. In this, you have to create something that's as big, as much more than the story as the score is more than the story. Mm. Yeah, very good, good. Um, can you uh, just d d describe or talk, not in great lengths, but about this production, about your take on it, on the story. Sure, I, I, I think that the easiest way to explain it is I've tried to approach the piece as a storyteller the same way an author uses magical realism because magical realism in the novel allows a writer to write something that is more than the actual story, that is a bigger, bigger um, narrative. Uh, and in the same way, our piece, um, diverges from the, 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 the specifics of the story that Mozart's telling in order to capture something more essential in the story that he's telling, which is, which is this you know, essential human experience of, of heartbreak. Um, while at the same time, what Mozart does so beautifully in Cosi Pantute is he, he, and Mozart, he does it everywhere so beautifully, but particularly in Cosi Pantute is capture both the ridiculous and the sublime at once and hold them in, um, in suspension and be able to manage both at the same time. And so I think with the production, we've also tried to create um, moments of, of absurdity and moments of absolute um, spiritual transcendence that aren't in, in um, tension with each, with each other, but rather are necessary for the other to exist. And what kind of world will they be seeing? Period, uh, kind of stage, so Cozy Fontuti is all about mythology in a way. It's about the myth that love is simple. <laughs> and it's about the uh, learning that it's possible to love two people at the same time, which is, which is you know, scary. Um, so we wanted to create a world that um, was equally about a myth that could be dispelled. So this is, in terms of the costuming, um, this, it's set in a sort of quintessential America 1950s. Um, that gets um, revealed throughout the production to be more complex than what it seems. 
Um, and then in terms of the set, we were inspired by Midsummer Night's Dream, which has a, ser a similar track for its characters and a similar theme that it's exploring. So it's set in um, a wood that, that we go deeper and deeper into and there are more and more trees and then the wood starts to, to respond in magical and surprising ways as these characters go into a, a, a more complex psychological space throughout the narrative as well. Very good. Um, it's a very beautiful, I mean, again, the other, what we saw the other night on stage, the first time on stage, it was our very first technical rehearsal and lighting was up in the air, but not being used in any way. And yeah, we saw there were trees, but they were just kind of hanging up in the air. But even with that in mind, um, I can tell it's very, um, it's just, it's very beautiful to look at. And it's very uh, simple, not simple, but, you know, simple in a way like a beautifully tailored dress is simple, but not simple. Uh, it's very beautiful. So I think people are really going to enjoy it. And it does reveal itself in different ways throughout uh, the opera. So um, but the one thing I did say to Tim when we first started talking about this is I've seen many productions of Quizzi Fan Tutte and many times uh, a director's take on a, on a newish production winds up being somewhat cynical because you have to deal with this idea about fidelity or infidelity or faithfulness and love and but it can oftentimes go to a place that feels cynical and I wanted to avoid that because I think that uh, actually goes against what Mozart wrote in the score. I don't think it winds up being in a cynical place. Um, and I think that you've done a really masterful job of, of walking that line. Uh, heartache, maybe heartbreak, and sadness and love and f f humor all together, but not cynical. Would you yeah, say I think, it's fair to say? I, yeah, I think these hard truths about being a human being make us more complex, but they don't make us less beautiful. They make us more beautiful. So it, it's really important mm. that a production of Cosi Fan Tutte be as beautiful in its complexity as Mozart's score. Yeah, that's beautifully said, because that's exactly true. The score belies that. I mean, it would it goes against the grain of some that I've seen where they do wind up in a very cynical place. So uh, that's great. Well, we've got to talk to our cast because I want you all to meet them. Many of you um, uh, are on what we call my uh, interview that I do every other week or once a month, depending upon how often, um, Aperitivo with artists. And the last one that I did, I actually, you all don't know this probably, or maybe you do, cast members. I actually just did it, instead of interviewing someone, I interviewed all of you via video examples of your singing. So I just, I chose things online. So I wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance uh, virtually to hear you and see you as an artist uh, before they see you uh, in Cozy. So most of them, most of these people have actually had a wonderful time seeing some of your virtual work. Uh, but let's start off with, uh, first on my list is Sarah Tucker, who is singing Fiordaligi. And Sarah, this is your second time in San Diego, correct? That's right. And remind everyone when you were here before. So I was here in 2019 singing Micaela and Carmen. So many of you saw her. Do you remember our Carmen, where she was our Michaela and she was a real standout. She was fabulous. Um, thing I love about Sarah is she looks very demure, and uh, so, <laughs> and not that you're not, um, but you have some steel. You have a little bit of metal in your voice, which I really love, and you also have a real domey round top. Uh, and Fiordaligi is a tough thing to cast because you got to have all that, and you got to get to move down into your chest with great ease and fearlessness, I think, and have a lot of agility and you have all of that. Is this your first Fiordaligi? It is, yeah. yes. It's really a good role for you. So, um, and when I was trying to find a Fiordaligi, I just remembered Sarah's singing uh, in Michaela and, and also just some of the stuff that you have online. And I was thinking, oh, I think that there's a Fiordaligi in there. So I said, can you record the two arias for me? And she sent a <laughs> two days later, I had them recorded in my uh, email. So and I was like, okay, I was right. Uh, so um, what do you love about this role, Sarah? So much. Um, I have to say that in the difficult singing comes a lot of freedom because you can't be timid about it. Um, and as someone who has struggled through periods of shyness in my performing career, and I've finally sort of come into myself as a performer in the last few years, um, 
it, it feels really powerful to sing Fior Feliti. Um, her vocal part is obviously really difficult, but also um, to create a character with sort of a, a shell that <laughs> the Fior de Ligi is sort of like um, a silhouette that you you can slowly turn into a, a real person, um, mm. which leave, I mean, not to say that Mozart didn't intend for her to be a real human being with depth and personality, but I think that there's a lot of room for interpretation. Um, and so I think most of that information is in the music and mm -hmm. it's been really fun to sort of make decisions about her character and her thought process based on um, musical things rather mm -hmm. than text things. And oh, very um, interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's different from other roles that I've worked on. So if, if ever I come to a point where I'm not quite sure I know what what she means or what she's saying, uh, always look at the music uh, for, for Fior de Ligi. It's a very, very interesting point. And I've said this to our audience several times that one of the things that opera can do that other art forms can't do is deal with subtext because you words can say one thing and then music can tell you something else. So sometimes if you do look deep into the score, you can find things that actually the text doesn't even tell you, but the composer yes. will tell you. Um, we have a lot to cover. We have a lot of people. So I'm going to move quickly through this. I just, uh, what have the last two years been like for you during COVID? Been tough, I'm sure. Well, um, difficult, but I've been really lucky to have some opportunities to still be performing. Um, and more than anything, I think so many other artists would agree. It's just made us so grateful for whatever singing opportunity we are presented with. Um, and rather than having that anxiety of what's next, you know, and always looking for how can I make this bigger, better, more frequent. There's sort of um, an appreciative relaxation and enjoying the moment now. So that's good. That's a learning point that maybe you can take with you in, forever in the future, right? That's a, yeah, a, that's a hope. positive outcome from this experience. Um, let's move on to our Doravella, Samantha Henke. Samantha, Sam, I don't see you on my screen, but I know you're here somewhere because I have two Hi. screens. There, I hear your voice. Hi, Hi, how are you? <laughs> Thanks. Happy to be here. Good. So this is your first time in San Diego singing. You've been here before, but I it's have. your first time here singing. Tell us about your connection to San Diego. Uh, I have a lot of my in-laws out here, actually. Um, they're all kind of California natives, and now they've all moved down to San Diego. They're out in Carlsbad, and... Uh, Finally, I'm getting to explore downtown. Yeah. Um, normally I'm up in Encinitas. So welcome, um, good experience so far. Loving it. Good, good. Santa Ana is not my favorite, but I'm loving being here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've told everyone, uh, just everyone that's on the call that's not a singer, like we, I warn everybody in the first rehearsal, we have Santa Ana's coming up because as everyone knows that lives here, it, the humidity drops to zero which is horrible for singers. It's just, it's terrifying because you, Anyway, uh, so we always tell people to get humidifiers and take care during Santa Ana's, but you sound fabulous. This is not your first Dora Bella, right? It's not, but I haven't sung her in about seven years. Yeah, yeah. It's been a, Good it's to been come a while. back to her? Yeah, totally different experience now. You know, a lot's happened in seven years. I, I feel like I've changed a lot as a singer and as a human. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting revisiting a role after so much time. What do you love about Dorabella and also just in general, this opera or singing Mozart, all three of those, whatever you want to answer? Ooh, there's a lot of things. Yeah. Um, I love singing Mozart. I feel like he is one of the composers that I understand the most. It's just, it feels very easy um, and logical. Uh, Dorabella as a character, it's really fun getting to play a woman um, and a lighthearted, young, fun, kind of carefree female at that. Um, and I love the ensemble singing. I, mm -hmm. I grew up singing in chorus a lot. And so for me getting to, to make music largely, um, always with, with my colleagues is, is really a joy because, you know, we just get to sing together and there's a safety in that. And um, yeah. It's, it's something that we don't get to do all the time. That's very nice. I mean, that idea of what it, what harmony really means. I mean, not just harmony musically, but harmony um, as humans together in that kind of moment yeah. uh, is one of the real joys about singing in an ensemble, right? You said singing, you know, 
portraying a woman. So I think we need to like elaborate on that a little bit. You sing a lot of <laughs> pants rolls, right? I sing a lot of pants rolls, especially this year. It's um, this will be my only female character the whole whole year. So you'll be wearing a dress. So, it was weird in my costume fitting. They said, how does this feel? And I thought, I haven't had anything on my waist like this uh, in a costume fitting in a very long time. It feels not great. It's very constrictive, <laughs> <laughs> but the costumes are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good. Um, all right, let's go on to Alisa Jordheim. Alisa, welcome back. Thank you so much. Yeah, so you guys might remember Alisa. This is her second time singing with us. Actually, her third fourth time in San Diego, but second time, fourth time seen in San Diego, but second time on our main stage. Tell them about your other roles so you can remind everyone who you were, that they've seen you before. So last time I was singing a very different role. I was singing Gilda in Rigoletto in 2019. So a very tragic story. And this is going to be a 180. Yeah. So yeah, you're not exactly the the tragic character in this no. one. But between now and then, you also sang at our gala. We brought you back to sing at our gala after Rigoletto. And then I very selfishly asked if it was OK to auction you off <laughs> at our gala yes. for a house concert, which uh, her bidding started going very high. So seriously, she's seated right next to me. And I'm up there with the auctioneer. And the bidding was you know, pushing up. And I just leaned over and I said, would you do two? And she said, sure. So she, so she did two house concerts for us because we made a lot of money off of her doing that. It's a very strange record. experience to be uh, to be bid on. Uh, <laughs> it could have gone, I don't know, really badly quickly, but uh, but no. I think it turned out well. Yeah, no, you, we, you, it was a really wonderful opportunity for us. And also, frankly, for other people to get a chance to hear you in their homes, which was a really nice, nice, um, I don't know, nice occurrence for us. So thank you for that again. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so tell us about, about uh, Despina. Oh, gosh. Well, Despina is just very fierce and feisty. And, um, you know, her view of love is very cynical. And I find it interesting to, you know, Mozart doesn't really give us a lot of, and De Ponte doesn't give us a lot of the backstory to her history. So kind of thinking about what could have happened in her history that brought her to this, to this point where she feels so cynical about love. Um, on the other hand, I find her very uh, progressive in that she says, you know, if men can go and do whatever they want, why can't women? So, um, so I find her a very interesting layered character. Mm. Um, and I think finding for my, my own uh, character development, finding some reasons as to why she might feel the way she does about love has been an interesting uh, journey for me. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you, you play Despina, but Despina plays some other people. So <laughs> you, you have to, um, you have to color your voice in ways that you have to find different voices, right? Yes, indeed. That, that has been, an, uh, I've spent a while kind of, uh, exploring different types of resonance and accents and, um, and also thinking about how to project my voice. Um, in this big house while uh, changing my voice. It, it's been a challenge, but I, I think that it's coming along well. Good, good, good. So tell tell our, just briefly, because I think it's been 16 years, I think, since we've done a Cozy here, so it's been a while. So many of our audiences may not be, really remember Cozy or they may not have seen Cozy before. So tell us a little bit about how Despina moves into other people. So, so Despina is, is helping Don Alfonso in this sort of uh, charade of mistaken identities. So she's brought in as a doctor um, to try and help the, the, the men who have are feigning illness by drinking poison. So she comes in with her um, kind of hilarious idea of how to heal them. Um, and in our production, it's going to be a reference to uh, a pretty familiar character, I think. And then she comes back at the end uh, as a notary to draw up a marriage contract uh, for the uh, disguised men and sisters. Um, and I think also uh, the notary will refer to a prominent person in our world. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 
Very good. That's that's actually a nice thing, a nice little tease. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, so I, you know, I, I haven't gotten to this with anybody, but I, one of the things I've said is like, what are a couple of things to watch for? Um, certainly, you've just laid out a couple of teases. You won't are, miss. Uh, you won't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> so you two are wearing a some a very beautiful dress at some point, but you're also wearing something else. You're wearing yeah. several things because you have to be a notary and you have to be, uh, you know, the doctor. But you also have another costume that you wear with another character. And, and yes, you know, I'm not. Am I allowed to 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 say what that is, or just another another tease there? I think you can say what it is. Why not? Okay, so Don Alfonso and I uh, come on stage as a cow, and um, it's a hilarious costume, and we've had a lot of fun coming up with uh, choreography. <laughs> very, very cute, very cute, very, very uh, a good pun. Yeah, look, the <laughs> cast members are. Is that the first time everyone's heard her say that? Okay, you saved it for us. Thanks, Lisa. That's nice. You're welcome. Yeah, it was. It's good material, though. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll yeah, be here so, for another two weeks. <laughs> so it's not every time you see, you know, two people in a cow costume in a production of Cozy. So I uh, just another moment to stay tuned for. Yes. Um, and I remember when I saw the we had a, our first design meeting where uh, Tim was talking about it with the scenic designer, but also the costume designer. And there was this like not even a real clear description of how or when it was going to be, but just, yeah, there's going to be this cow costume with uh, Dustin and Don Alfonso. And I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to be interesting, but it's interesting. So yes. I think Bruce, Bruce Stasna has to leave us. So we want to say thank you, Bruce, for coming. He has to get to the theater. So uh, uh, thanks, Bruce, for being a part Ciao, of this. Ciao, thanks for having me. See, see you. Yep. Uh, OK, let's move along, because we're, oh gosh, we're halfway through the hour. This was happens. I like to talk. Uh, so our next cast member is John Brancy, who is the first of our two men, and he's in the role of Guglielmo. John, hello. Hello. Welcome aboard. Thank you. <laughs> and this is your first time singing in San Diego. Have you ever sung any in any role, any capacity in San Diego before? Um, no, uh, one of my closest friends and a pianist that I work with, uh, Peter Dugan, got married here. <laughs> so that was that's the only time I've I've been to San Diego. So, uh, I don't but know you live you different. live where? I live in Los Angeles at so, the moment. Yeah, kind of due to the pandemic, actually. Yeah, uh, you know, because a, a lot of us found found a place to stay for yeah, that time period. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it's great to have you. Uh, John and I knew each other a long time ago in New York. Uh, he worked with Gotham Chamber Opera when you were very young. How old were you? I think that was 2013. I think yeah. that's when and that was. Were, yeah. Were you right out of, you were just out of school. I was still in right? school. I yeah. think I was still in school. Yeah. Yeah. And a really interesting uh, Charpentier one act opera, which was, you played two roles though. I did. I played the god Apollo and then I played an, a, a ghoul from the underworld. As one does. Right? Yeah, as one does. <laughs> it was a great was production. Painted, I believe I was painted gold for Apollo right. and I was wearing like rags for the yeah. for the ghoul. <laughs> yeah. I remember the ghoul because you were like sort of writhing yeah, from the stage. Yes, that's right. that's right. That's right. It was really great. So welcome. It's so great to have you with us. This is not clearly not your first Guglielmo because you just did it in San Francisco when? Uh, just this this fall, I was yeah. in San Francisco performing it, and it was my that was my first time doing the role. Very good. So uh, yeah. two two right away, one after another, and is um, tell us about how you feel about this role and what you like about this role, and also what you like about Mozart. Yeah, well, I've sung Figaro, um, and the Tessitura is similar, but Guglielmo is a little bit higher. Um, it also depends on where you go in the ensembles, mm -hmm. uh, but I could say that they're very, very similar and very closely related. I've also learned Don Giovanni and loved that as well, but um, I'd say like Guglielmo and, and Figaro are, are similar characters, you know, mm -hmm. different sides of the same coin almost. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and the, the time that I've been able to you know, spend with the character in this, you know, past uh, six months plus, because I was learning it in the summer, um, I actually was jumping into that project as well. Uh, I wasn't supposed to sing Guglielmo at San Francisco. It was supposed to be the year before during the pandemic. And 
the that one you know that baritone couldn't couldn't come to uh, perform that. Um, so it was actually a uh, an opportunity to you know step up and, and learn the role for that um, in a few months. Wow. So it's it's been a uh, this opportunity to like do it again is actually fantastic to be able to like you know further solidify the stuff that I uh, I was really working on and, and hoping to do more of. Yeah. Um, and now of course I have a different interpretation of the text of the scenes of so much with this production, which I'm really excited to explore, uh, and with the character that I, I think is fresh and and different and compelling. That's great. You know, uh, it's for our audience, this is a very strong ensemble show. We've talked about that a lot, but ensemble shows more than some of the other offers really do give you a way to feel fresh, right? Like, because you spend so much time working uh, vocally with all of all of the cast. Oftentimes in other operas, there are people that you don't even really relate to. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, you're really singing with each of the characters in substantial ways. So it's an opportunity to, to bring a fresh face to a character you've already explored, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what you like about Mozart in general. Um, um, I, I love how he, it kind of feels like, Mozart to me is kind of like a massage for the voice mm. in some ways, you know. <laughs> it's like in terms of the, the repertoire that's out there for opera to sing, it, if, you, if you can really just sing it with a sense of ease, um, with the right dynamics and, you know, not too much pressure, on the voice, it really does feel like it's almost healing for the, mm. for the instrument. Mm. Um, and I, I feel like the more Mozart, I mean, it's challenging, of course. There's extreme challenges with, you know, timing and intonation and like all of the different, you know, ways that Mozart brings back repetition and, and stuff like that. But specifically just for the instrument and for the, you know, moving forward in life, I hope I get to always come back to Mozart because it's it's something that brings a freshness to to singing for me. For That's opera. great. Yeah, sort of a, 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 a balm in a way. Yeah, so yeah. I, as far as the as far as all the repertoire goes, mm -hmm. he's he kind of knew exactly what to do. It's great. Tell us about what the last couple of years have been like for you. Have you been busy singing, or have you had to you last? You were in San Francisco, clearly, but before yeah. then, did you have a hiatus or? Oh uh, yeah, of course. Um, I had a lot of projects cancel, as we all did, and I took it, the opportunity to teach and had a studio of about twenty-five students on Zoom, actually, Great. Great. and became very comfortable, you know, teaching uh, students of all different ages uh, from around the world. So that was an incredible experience to get to know all of these amazing singers that we have, you know, up and coming at universities and, and, and whatnot, because a lot of them were, were at home and they took advantage of the opportunity to work with people uh, that were also not, not working. So um, that, was, that was a great experience. But before that, I've done a, you know, a lot of new music and new operas uh, and really, really interesting productions that are you know, occurring all around um, in, in Europe and Canada and in America. And uh, I'm also, very interested and I love to do recital work. I'm, I'm very keen on that. And I have a couple of albums if you're interested in, in hearing those. <laughs> oh, very good, good. So yeah. look up John on uh, online and you yeah, can- on, out his... on Apple or uh, any other streaming service, uh, just my name. Very cool. Some stuff, yeah. Very nice. All right, let's uh, meet Konu Kim, who is our Ferrando, who is Guillermo's sidekick, I will say. Uh, so, uh, welcome. Your first time in San Diego. Hello. Yes, yes. And enjoying yourself? Having a good time? Yeah, yeah, like that fantastic city. Because I'm, I'm living in London, so uh, mostly, you know, <laughs> the weather is... I, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't find the, the sunny days. You know, yeah, so. it's it's a nice day today. So uh, uh, hope, tomorrow's a day off. So hopefully you will be able to enjoy some sunshine tomorrow, I, all of you. So yeah. um, it's so great to have you here. Uh, this is not your first Ferrando. When did you sing it before? Yeah, last season I 
the the the, the, the same opera Christmas too, the inner Glyburn Opera Festival. Festival. Yeah. Yes, in in Louis. And yes, this is uh, my debut. Yeah. debut. Yeah. And yeah, this is a uh, second. Very good. I've seen yeah. that that production was a very beautiful production, but um uh somewhat traditional, I will say. Uh yes, yes, this is traditional. This is not. Uh, no. So, are you enjoying this? something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and you and you and John both get to be cowboys at a point, correct? Yes. Exactly. So when I was in the rehearsal room last week, I saw you both practicing um, a lasso, spinning a lasso. So uh, yes, a lasso. So you guys get to see them both show us their skills with rope at some point in this opera. How's it going? Frank, you guys were sort of working uh, hard on that the other day. Frankly, the joint is really good to the muscle. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have a you talent yet. about the cowboy thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get it, I'm sure. No problem. Yeah. Um, I'm practicing it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you, what? Uh, you're based in London. The past couple of years, did you have us just like we everyone in the United States? Did your career just stop? For a while, yes, exactly. Sadly, but I'm um, luckily I got a, a free role debut in the, in the pandemic. So happy that, but yeah, mostly it was tough, huh? So, yeah. Yes, all every theater is closed. Yeah, yeah. Do you sing much Mozart? Is this is Berando your only Mozart role? Do you sing other Ooh. roles of Mozart? Well. I love the Mozart repertoire, but I don't have any lot of chance to sing. What Mozart do you because, mostly uh, sing? Tell, tell our, our 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 patrons here what sort of roles you mostly. What is your repertoire typically? Oh yeah, Per Canto Opera is for me very suit me uh, because of my my voice range is a bit high, the high tenor, but yeah, the the the. Many of Mozart the uh, repertoire is a bit lower than in my range, yes. voice range. So yeah, sometimes I'm really comfortable to sing because I don't have any stress to get a high note. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah. sometimes I don't have any warm up before the rehearsal or something or, or given performance. <laughs> but it's okay. But no got no pressure just to sing the A or C flat, well, B flat like this. You just get to so, sing. So, but the most beautiful uh, Unara Amorosa, the most beautiful tenor aria. Uh, yeah, this is okay. just, and it's so beautiful in this production. It's very simple. Exactly. Very yes, beautiful. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, Unara Amorosa is my uh, first learning aria. So, yes. very special for me. <laughs> and yeah, I just uh, feeling the back to my first. The beginning. First, um, yeah, the beginning of uh, the learning the vocal, some lesson. Very nice. Very, very <laughs> yeah. nice. All right, let's let's uh, move on to, we have two more people to talk to. I'm going to come back with a question for everybody at the end, and I want to make sure we have time if we have some questions from our audience too. So uh, we also have Reginald Smith Jr., who can we can call you Reggie, right? Absolutely. Yeah, who is our Don Alfonso? So welcome, Reggie. Hi, it's good to be here. Great to have you with us. And tell us, is this your first Don Alfonso? It is my first Don Alfonso, and it's been a wonderful challenge, but it's good to uh, to uh, sing this uh, repertoire. It's very, yeah. very fun. What do you what is the challenge? What are the challenges or some of the challenges of singing Mozart or Don Alfonso in particular? Yeah, you know, one of the most beautiful things that I get to sing, of course, is the Soave Si El Vento trio. And so that's gorgeous. But of course, it sits right in that wonderful middle high part of the voice. And it's very delicate. So that's, that's very challenging. The other thing that's challenging for me is all of the recitative because mm -hmm. it's in those moments that Mozart really shows us the story and moves the drama ahead and my character being sort of the puppet master of the entire show has to move a lot of the drama forward so it's <laughs> it's fun though it's it's fun uh because you get to explore a lot of different colors 
vocally and a lot of different uh, nuances of the text and, and, and how you really sort of set up all of the drama that happens during the show. So it's, it's really been fun. So you puppet master, that's a good word. Um, we, we see you <laughs> in a costume at a certain point or sitting at the side of the stage in a director's chair with a director's, like a movie director's horn. Uh, so that's also sort of a take on it is right. You're the director, you're making the drama move forward. Correct, correct. Yeah. yeah, so we'll, so our audience will actually see that in this production, which I think is really smart. Um, but you do have a lot of recit you got to deal with. <laughs> you have a lot. Just a uh, lot. Yeah. Um, and I think everyone knows this. Remember that, you know, the recitative, as, as Reggie said, is really where the story quickly moves forward. And then ensembles and uh, arias, yes, drama and story moves forward with those, but there's more reflection in those or telling of emotion or things, but the actual driving forward of the drama happens quickly in recitative and it's, it's hard. It's a lot of work. So a lot of it sits on your shoulders and I don't envy you. I got to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what the last couple of years were like for you. Well, you know, like many of my colleagues, I mean, March 2020 was sort of like a ton of bricks. Everything just abruptly stopped. Um, but like John, I used the opportunity to do some teaching. So my um, undergraduate degrees are in vocal performance, but also music education, teaching kindergarten through 12th grade choral music. Because um, I always thought I was going to be a high school choir teacher, but, you know, life happens that way. Funny, right? Um, in a good way. In a good in way. In a good way. Uh, so I did a, a, a quite a bit of teaching, which was great fun. I was still busy singing, um, doing different projects and much like you all, uh, the Atlanta Opera did shows outside during the pandemic. So singing Pagliacci, singing Tonio with a mask on 11 times mm. was uh, an adventure. Mm. Uh, but we made it work. Uh, but also what I did during the pandemic was I decided I wanted to go back and get my master's in vocal performance because I always wanted the degree, but I didn't like going to school. And so I uh, discovered that because I had so many credits, that if I was able to, you know, really buckle down and do it, that I could get through with it uh, within a year. And so since I had the extra free time, uh, that's that was my pandemic project. So I was very, I'm glad it's over. I don't miss writing 15 page papers on Beardy, but. Uh... Yeah. So you did, you did in a vocal performance, right? Yes. And yes. you did that during the pandemic? Yes, because most of the classes were online or hybrid. So I was and, able to still be on the road and uh, take classes. And what did you do for a recital? So my recital was quite interesting. And it was my project for the semester. I did songs that are not in English, particularly using texts that deal with longing and love. So my recital, all in foreign languages, all by Black composers, had uh, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Yoruba uh, from Nigeria, Banda. Uh, I had some Mandarin on the recital. Um, so it was, it was a fun project, exploring a lot of different repertoire that uh, I look forward to, you know, programming on other recitals and concerts. And did you, was it a, a, a virtual concert or was it live? No, it was live. So I went to the University of Kentucky for undergrad and for, and I'm I'm a big old wildcat. I bleed blue, not not that Michigan blue, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky blue. And so it was great actually being able to go back um, to the campus and being grilled during my master's thesis stuff and all of that. But it was great to present the recital. That's great. That's a great story. Uh, so uh, you told us about the challenges of uh, Don Alfonso. Tell us a little bit about what you like about. Don Alfonso. Well, again, you know, one of the best part about singing this role is that you get to sing that glorious trio. Uh, but one of the things that you've mentioned several times that I really have enjoyed about the show is that it's really an ensemble show. And all of my colleagues are extraordinary singers, but they're also extraordinary human beings. And being able to work with each and every one of them has really been the highlight of this entire experience. So. Thank you to each of you uh, for helping me through this, uh, but 
also making this really uh, a beautiful moment. I love singing with, with, with everybody on stage. It's great. That's such a uh, nice, really beautiful sentiment. But it's also one of the things that, you know, I, as we go back into a theater uh, and being in a rehearsal room, just the little bit that I was able to be in, it's like, oh, yeah, that's part of what we do. It's not just what's on stage. It's yeah. the experience of being together and sharing and, you know, sharing art and all of that that we've been missing for the past couple of years that now that we're able to do it again, it reminds us why we're lucky to do what we do for a living. Um, even from my side, too, from being on the side of putting opera together now, you know, I think most of you know I was a singer and now on this side being still involved in that and the, what, why we're doing what we're doing is, remi I'm reminded of that now. Uh, we have one more person to talk to that I need to introduce, and he, he is in the role of, which you don't normally see in uh, Così Fan Tutte, the role of Cupid. And that is our actor supernumerary, uh, Jack Missett. And Jack, welcome. I think maybe you're on mute. Let's see. And he is outside of the- There city. we are. There, there you are. go. And you yeah. are outside of the Civic Theater, I can see, meaning that you're ready to go into rehearsal. So tell <laughs> us about, you are Cupid in this production and why do we have a Cupid and what do you do in this production? Well, that would be a question for Tim uh, <laughs> about why we have a, a Cupid. Uh, by the way, uh, yes, I got a, a five o'clock uh, costume fitting uh, which I'm very anxious to see what I'm going to be looking like. Uh, and so that's why I'm standing outside. I just drove down from North County. Uh, no, the, uh, <clears throat> the role of uh, Cupid uh, was, uh, let's put it this way. There is no script. I do not sing. I do not speak. Um, and so everything has been learned as we've gone through the uh, rehearsals. And uh, Tim uh, has been very uh, uh, kind to me because um, I'm surrounded by a great deal of talent. And um, I uh, have pondered quite a few uh, things about why Cupid is doing what he is doing, which he does uh, experience uh, some different personas. Um, and uh, so anyway, it, it makes for a very interesting uh, story of how he relates to the other, the characters in the play uh, and uh, how uh, they relate to him. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's been a wonderful experience. It's been a lot of work, uh, but uh, I've learned a, a great deal um, all the way and uh, um, it, it's been a lot of fun too. So. Good. So, and you are a local actor. Yes. Yes. I, I uh, live up in North County and um, I've been involved in theater since I was about seven years old. Uh, but um, I helped uh, get the New Village Arts Theater in Carlsbad going for the first five years. They did all their plays at our office uh, studio and um, also uh, North Coast Rep. Um, there were a spinoff from the uh, theater on the fairgrounds that, uh, and uh, I uh, helped uh, them uh, with uh, uh, their um, uh, publicity and, and uh, that sort of thing. I, I actually did a little physical work of sawing wood and hammering nails. But um, so anyway, yes, I've, I've been in theater for a long time. Is it your first time to perform at the Civic? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. my first time down here. I've, I've done other sh done plays uh, down uh, in San Diego. As a matter of fact, uh, we moved out from Chicago, my wife and I. She had this great idea for <clears throat> a business, and uh, we we got out here. And uh, I um, my second play <laughs> was Hot L Baltimore, and it ran for fourteen months. <laughs> wow. And finally, the cast posted uh, closing. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, you know, that's a good, pretty good run, I got to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, it was. So. That's great. So I'm going to ask one quick question of everybody. We're going to go backwards. We're going to start with Jack. 
what's next for you after uh, this? If you're still, if you're acting, what's the next thing up for you? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I have uh, heard uh, a word about doing a play. I, I'll let it go uh, nameless. Uh, okay. Actually, just before COVID struck, I'd been cast uh, in uh, August Osage County. And um, I, like three days later, it was shut everything down. So yeah. it may be that we'll get back to doing that play. Great, great. Reggie, what's next for you? Well, I leave here on the 21st and I get to Chicago on February 27th, completely different winter experience, yeah. uh, to do Fire Shut Up In My Bones, uh, the lyric. And then my season is usually about a third uh, concert and recital rep. So I leave Fire and I go right and do a Messiah. Then I leave Messiah and do Rigoletto. Okay. Then I leave Rigoletto and I do Beethoven 9. And wow. then I have an Aida. And then I go back to Beethoven 9. And then Castor and Patience in Cincinnati. So very busy and I'm super appreciative. Uh, and I can't wait until I think August 1st is my next full break. <laughs> wow, well, good for you. It's good to jump in right back in. So that Absolutely. is great. Kanu, what is next for you? I've got a very interested, uh, interesting production in San Francisco in July. So and we also kicking off a fifth of May. And they, the opera is a, the Dream of Red Chamber. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, Excellent. yeah. The San Francisco. Yes, yeah, San Francisco. Great. Congratulations, great. Thanks. John, what about you? Well, I had another thing get postponed. I was supposed to do a world premiere in Montreal afterwards uh but it's possible i'll be back in new york city for a couple of things i'm gonna be appearing in in milwaukee uh for a, a duraflay requiem excellent and, um yeah, yeah and a, and a few other things uh, are coming up in the summer um but yeah the uh some, some great you can up. say you can uh see elisa there while, while you're in exactly. milwaukee where you live. Alisa, say hello and tell us hello. what's next for you. Yeah, so next for me, a week after this, I'm doing my first Susanna in Le Nozze di Figaro in Virginia. Great. So um, when I'm not in rehearsal here, I am working on other recit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and then after that, I'm doing um, Adele in uh, Deflator Mouse in Central City in the summer. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Samantha? Thanks. After this, I uh, trade the dress back for pants and I go to Munich, uh, immediately to Munich for Nozze di Figaro, just in Carabino. I'll be back in Munich again uh, in the spring for De Hosenkavalier. And uh, I also have some recitals in New York at Alistair Hall and a recital at London's Wigmore Hall. Great. Sarah? <laughs> Uh, so a few weeks after we wrap up here, I go to sing more Mozart, uh, this time Pamina and the Magic Flute at North Carolina Opera uh, with my husband, who's singing Zorostro. Oh, so very good. Very yeah. good. It's fantastic. I always love it when we're able to do that, when we're able to find, you know, an opportunity for a married couple to actually be in the same city singing together. Because <laughs> it, yes, it ain't easy, right? That's a bad, that's yeah. a difficult part of the job. Um, Tim, are you still with, let me see, where's Tim? Is Tim still with us? He just walked by here. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so he's actually in the theater, so he had to go in as well. I wanna thank everyone for coming and I wanna thank our wonderful artists and our uh, creative team for being here. It's a beautiful production. And I wanna tell you, if you've, not, if you've not encouraged your friends to buy tickets, please do. It's, um, it's extraordinarily beautiful music, but it's extraordinarily beautifully sung. So you're gonna be really, really pleased with what you hear and what you see. It's gonna be fun too. So thank you all very much. Thank you to everyone for participating and uh, good night. <laughs>